promise. I thank you for the hope that your word gives us. And Father, I pray this morning that you would bring forth the Holy Spirit to move in our midst, Father. I pray that you would anoint me with the words to preach and to say, and that you would open up our hearts to receive and to understand what your word is telling us. Lord, we want to believe, and I pray that all doubt would be gone. And that you would move in our hearts this morning. That your word would penetrate in the planting. And that it would bring forth a fruit and a harvest. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 1. But before I read this, I want to real quick give a, uh, a preview on where we're at in this. So God has given a prophecy to Isaiah. And he's told him. That because of Israel's sin, and because they've refused to repent of their sin, that there was going to be judgment that was going to come upon Israel. And I want us to know this morning that God is rich in mercy. He is rich in love. He loves to show grace. In fact, grace is the only way that God will deal with mankind. Because we are so fallen, there's no good in us. And there's no way that a holy God that is pure and that can't even look upon evil, can have anything to do with such sinful people as we are outside of grace. It is grace that he deals with us. And I thank God for that. That old hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. That, that old hymn that declares that I am wretched, I am a sinner, but thank God for his amazing grace that he deals with us. Amen? And this morning, as we're looking at Israel, and Israel is a type of us today, and throughout the Old Testament, it isn't like we just throw it away because it's Old Testament. We can use it as a type on how God deals with you and I even. So Israel had turned off into sin. They were, they were following after idols, much like people today in the, in, the, in the modern church. They have left their first love. They have turned their back on Christ. They have, uh, are coming in worship and they're singing songs but yet their heart is far from him and it's the same way that israel was they, they still wanted the promises of god but they didn't want to submit to the rule of god 
And because of this, God says, I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to come and I'm going to have to punish you because you are refusing to humble yourself, repent, and turn back to me. And what God tells them is, he says in verse 1, that there will come a day that seven women will take hold of one man and they will say, we will eat your own bread, we will wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. They say, we will eat our own bread and we will wear our own clothing. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Now, leading up to this, we see that all, uh, and he calls them the daughters of Zion. He says that they were playing the harlot. They were turning and worshiping other gods, which was spiritual adultery in the eyes of the Lord. They were like a woman that was not being faithful to her husband, but had gone off and was being promiscuous with other gods and other idols. And God says that he would bring such a shame to them that there would be seven women that would come to one man and they would say, we'll provide for ourselves. You don't have to do the duties of a husband for us. You don't have to put clothes on our back. You don't have to provide for us. You don't have to, to do any of these things. We can take care of ourselves. Just give us your name to take away our shame. And you know, the modern church does the very same thing today. And I want to use this as an example to us as we look at this, at this example that Jesus says in Luke. If you turn to Luke with me, chapter 6. That much of the church today are like those women. We want to take care of ourselves. We don't want to submit to the authority of God. We don't want to submit to the rule of God, but yet we want the name of Jesus to be identified with us. We want God as our Savior, but we don't want Him as our Lord. And this is the message that I have on my heart this morning to share with us, is for us to look into the mirror of our heart today. Is Jesus truly the Lord of our life? Because a Lord holds the authority. The Lord holds the counsel. And the servant submits to what the Lord says. And a lot of people want Jesus to be their Savior. In fact, if you even would poll a lot of the world, they would talk about Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And, and they would talk about even Jesus rising from the dead. They would, they would have this thought and knowledge in their mind. But yet they will refuse to submit to the rule of God. They refuse to lift up the authority of Jesus Christ and truly make Jesus their Lord. And this morning, I want us to, to know that we cannot get into heaven without Jesus being our Lord and our Savior. Right. We can't just believe in Jesus to forgive me of my sins, but yet refuse to submit to him. And that's what Isaiah is saying, is that there will be seven women that would refuse to submit to the rule of their husband. And it would be so drastic, instead of one woman for one man, it would be that many women for one man. And they would say, we will take care of ourselves. You don't have to do anything for us. We don't even want you to. We'll do it ourselves. We can do it our way. But just give us your name so that we aren't going to be ashamed. We want you to be our Savior. We want to say in Jesus' name. But we don't want to have to come under the Lordship and the authority and submission to what Jesus Christ says. And he says here in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now, imagine you're standing in front of Jesus Christ when he is literally in the flesh. He's standing in front of you. And you even call him Lord. And he says to you, why do you call me Lord and yet disobey me? Why do you call me Lord and yet refuse to submit to the authority and my lordship? He goes on and he says, whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings. This is number one. We've got to hear. A lot of people are spiritually deaf. They hear the message. They hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and they cannot even understand it. It doesn't even penetrate into their spiritual ear. But he says, he that hears it. And then he says, and does it. 
I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man that built his house and he digged deep. And he laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it because it was founded upon a rock. But he says, he that hears and does not is like a man that is without a foundation. He's built upon a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. He says the difference between he that just hears it and he that does it is the difference between heaven and hell. Is the difference between whether our foundation is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ or whether it's built upon the sand. It's, it's important to be noticed that both are houses. Both are construct, constructurally built. They both have an appearance of being safe, a home even. But one will immediately fall the moment a storm rises, and the other one will stand the test. I've heard it being said about the palm tree. The palm tree has such a deep root system that even in the midst of a hurricane, it bends with the hurricane. Now, you could take the mightiest of oaks, the, the trees that are around here in our neck of the woods, we, you know, we, we look at the mighty oak you know, as being a great, great, powerful, strong tree, but yet it can't stand a hurricane. It will, it will literally topple over, and its whole, whole root system will just come up right out of the ground. But a palm tree, which is much smaller than an oak, yet is built for the climate that it's in, it's dug deep so that when that hurricane force winds come, that palm tree literally just bends with the wind. And after the, the storm passes and all this calm and there's just destruction everywhere, those palm trees are still standing while that mighty oak is toppled over. You see, the difference is how deep we're founded is Jesus Christ the Lord of our life? Are we dug down into the foundation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified? And we know what He did for us. And it's not just up here, but it's in our heart. We believe it. We live it. We know it. And we're serving Him. Because we believe His word. We've heard it. And we believe it. And so we're going to do it. There's people that I know that in the terms of Isaiah 4 and these, these women and throughout the Bible... God uses marriage as a type of our relationship with Christ. I know people who have lived together their, their whole lives. They refuse to get married. They, they will even say, well, it's just a piece of paper. God knows my heart. They will say all of these things, but they, yet they refuse to come together in a matrimonial covenant before God. They, they, they want the benefits of marriage without commitment. And they might even lie to themselves and say, well, I am committed. I, I, I promise that I will only be true and faithful to this one. But yet have refused to then humble themselves and make that vow before men and God. And that's what people do today with, with the Lord. <laughs> they take that same idea of living unmarried. And they take that into our relationship with Jesus Christ. We refuse to truly commit to him. We want him as our, as our Savior. We don't want to go to hell. We want our sins forgiven. I want to spend forever in heaven. And we even say words like, he's died on the cross for my sins. But yet we refuse to dig deep into the foundation of the word of God and plant ourselves by truth. And because we've heard the truth and we believe the truth, we're going to live the truth. I thank God for people like many of you who have heard the word of God and then you line yourself up with it. Even if it's against the way we were raised. Because I got to tell you, there's things that I've been, I was raised in believing that as the Lord began to reveal it to me, I started to realize that's wrong. I was taught wrong. And even though I was taught and raised a certain way, God's word prevails. And I dig a little deeper. And I guarantee you the wind is going to blow in your life. The hurricane is going to come. This world does not pass by anyone without trying to leave a mark. And the only way we're going to survive this storm is if our root system is grounded in the foundation of Jesus Christ. And the older I get and the more experience I have in living, I realize how much more I need Jesus. I realize how much more I ain't going to make it through this life and get to heaven where I want to be without digging deep, 
without his word as my guiding light. He says, why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say? The Bible says that any man who sets himself to the plow, puts his journey on, and then looks back on where they came from, isn't fit for the kingdom of God. God has called us out of this world into his marvelous light. And now that we have been saved, he wants us to submit fully to the word of God. Submit fully to his lordship. Not to just want Jesus in name only. Not to just say, yeah, I have a church that I attend to. But to truly <coughs> have Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I submit to his rule in my life. And he is the one that governs me. And every decision that I make in my life is based upon his word. That's how he wants us to be. Is that when something is coming at us, what does God's word say? What does God want me to do? And I can tell you through every hurricane, spiritual hurricane that I've gone through, every trial that this world and Satan has thrown against me and God has allowed me to go through, I would not be here today if it wasn't for this book that's laying in front of me right now. If I didn't have the holy word of Almighty God that I would go to and fall upon and find out what was God's will for my life, I would not be here today. In fact, the reason I'm saved today is because on a night that I was being tried upon by the Holy Spirit, I opened up this book, and the words of life came to me. Lord. And I knew God was saying, repent today, because you don't have tomorrow. That's right. Now is the day that you got to get right with me, because tomorrow won't come for you. If you don't give your life to me today, this very hour, this moment, all of these things that you've gone through, has come down to this one moment in time. Where this is your moment and chance to accept Christ, not only as a savior of your sins, but as the Lord and the guiding power in your life. I thank God that on that day in 1999, November 4th, I got saved. I cried out to Jesus Christ and I said, I'm, I'm going to make Jesus be the Lord of my life. I repented of all of my sins and everything that I was. I'm trying to be good enough and then not even caring. I repented of it all, and I said, Jesus, I need you. And I thank God that he came into my heart. He literally changed me from within. And from that moment to this very moment today, every day has been as God has been doing a work within me, changing me, changing the way I think, changing the way I do things. Because as I hear it, I believe it. Amen? And I want to tell you today, in closing, that Satan is out to attack you and me. He's out to get us to believe lies. In fact, the other, I don't know, it was a few weeks ago. I was sleeping and I woke up. I don't know if I was dreaming or whether I just woke up hearing it. But I heard the words, righteousness does not come by faith. And I sat up and I thought, whoa. I'm delirious with sleep. Righteousness does not come by faith. And I thought, wow, that, that sounds, because I, I, God spoke to me like that before. And right then I thought of his, his word. And I said, wait, 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 wait a minute. But Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Glory. Now wait a minute, the just, the justified are going to live by faith. And I said, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you get away from me. Yes. I won't believe your lies. Now, what was that? In the middle of my sleep, the devil was trying to influence me. Yes. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of people that are being influenced that same way. They're going to jump up out of bed, say they got a revelation from God. They're going to start preaching something that they heard and that they said God told them. Yes. And it's a direct opposition of what God's word says. So what was it that kept me in the truth? Yes. It was his holy word. Yes. And if I didn't know this... And if I didn't hold this and cling to it, at that moment, I could have been deceived that easily, that quickly. I could have said, guys, listen, I got a new revelation from God and started to preach the opposite of what God's word says. But it was the holiness and the truth of God's word that kept me on track. I want to tell us today, if your foundation isn't dug deep into the word of God, if he isn't the Lord and the authority in your life, then you're like that, those women who only want Jesus for what he can give you. But you'll say, I'll do it my way, just give me your name. 
I don't want to submit to you as my Lord. I only want you for what you can give to me. And that's what the prosperity doctrine that is taught in the Christian church today. It's all about what God can give them, not what I can do for the Lord. It's about getting rich and blessed and fat and sassy, healthy and wealthy, and nothing about opposition and the argument of trying to stand upon God's word. And that, those are why so many people today are deceived. If you buy your heart with me this morning, without God's holy word, we are going to be deceived today. And I got to tell you, it scared me when that happened when that, in that dream. But it also encouraged me because I praise the Lord. The devil don't want me preaching what I'm preaching. So he's trying to influence me not to preach what I'm preaching. But it also scared me because that's how fast and easy it is that we can get tricked without the word of God as our foundation. So that rotten, dirty devil, that liar, the deceiver, the accuser of the brethren. How dare he try to infiltrate into us to try to change the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I want to say today, what you believe makes all the difference. Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Or are you just using Jesus and his name to get something? I don't want to just use Jesus. I want to cling to that old rugged cross. I want to dig deep in my, in my faith. Be grounded in truth. Because I know Satan is out to steal, kill, and to destroy. And he doesn't show favoritism. It doesn't matter how old we are or how young, how educated or how uneducated. Satan wants our soul. Because if you're the richest or the poorest person in the world, your soul is the same. It doesn't matter what this life has accounted to us. Every one of our souls is equal. And it's either going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. And he, Jesus is either our Lord, and we have submitted to his rule, and we have said, Jesus Christ is my authority, and I submit to what he tells me to do. And I will only go where he tells me to go, like a good servant. And I will only say and do what he tells me to say and to do. Or else we are only using him for what we can get out of him. And Jesus says, many on that day of judgment will say to me, but Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? I attended church. I gave to the poor. I prophesied and I even listened and, and I ate at your banquet. I even listened to you preach in the street. And Jesus says, on that day, I will look at them and I will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't want that to be me. But listen, I understand that all I am is one dream away from deception. All I am is one moment from listening to a lie from Satan to get off track. And I don't want to be there. I want to be dug deep. And I thank God that this word that he has given me and that is laying in front of you on your lap this morning is the very thing that will keep us in the truth. Because as the word of God began to come to me in the middle of the night, what does God's word say? You see, Satan tempted Jesus. Three different times he tempted him. And if you read it, every response that Jesus said back to Satan was, thus says the Lord. This is what God's word says. Because his word will keep us. I'm asking you this morning, have you submitted to Jesus Christ as your Lord? If you haven't, I want to beg you, submit to him today. I'm not going to ask you to come forward and raise your hands and to repeat a prayer because we can do that and then walk away and harden our heart and never really have submitted to him as our Lord. In fact, people do wedding vows all the time. They don't even mean it. They get divorced the next day. And that's what people do with many altar calls. They come and they say a covenant before God in, in words. They promise him that they'll be true and faithful. And they walk away and they cheat on the Lord. So I'm not going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to give him your life today. Right where you're sit sitting. Right where you're at. 
And even if you're not in this sanctuary this moment and you're watching this later over the internet, wherever you are at, give your vow to Jesus Christ that you will submit to Him as your Lord and Savior. Ask Him to come into your life and to forgive you. Turn from our sins and repent of what we have done. And vow to Him that you'll be true and faithful to Him. And then do it. Because any bride or any groom that vows to be faithful to their spouse and then cheats on them have not been true to their vow. And yet we do that to Jesus when we say, come into my life, I want you to be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins, but yet we refuse to submit to Him as our Lord. Heavenly Father, I ask you this morning as we are here in this place of worship, may you come into this place because I can't save nobody. Nobody can save anyone here except for you. And it's done individually <laughs> when the heart believes under repentance and the mouth confesses and cries out to you. At that moment, there's salvation. It doesn't matter if we're in a church building or we're in our car. It doesn't matter if we're at work or at school or where we're at. You have saved countless souls right where they were. Father, I ask that you would move in our lives this morning. If there's anyone here that has professed you as to be their Savior, but has not submitted to you as their Lord, I pray this morning would be the day. Because we're not promised tomorrow. We're not even promised the next hour. That we would make sure that we are submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ. To your will, faith in the cross of Calvary, what you did for us. Surrendering to you and obeying your word. And I give you praise in hopes that there will be souls won to the kingdom of God today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.